Why would a brand new leader decide to pick up 500 tons of trash as one of his first priorities? Welcome to part two of our special CEO roundtable recorded live at APTA Expo. Hi, I'm Paul Comfort, host and producer of Transit Unplugged. In part one, these CEOs talked about what their first year on the job has been like, what surprised them, and what inspires them to keep doing this work. Look for the link to part one here in the show notes. And now, in part two of this program, we rejoin Dave Deck from TriRail, Corey Cuff Lonergan from Broward County Transit, Dottie Watkins from Cap Metro in Austin, Tiffany Homler Hawkins from Lynx in the host city of Orlando, and Frank White from KCATA in Kansas City, talking about what are the top tech trends they'll implement in the next few years and the best or most fun project going on right now at their agency. Let's jump back into the conversation where we left off in part one and make sure you stick around to the end for LA Carries Marketing Minute. Enjoy the show. All right, we're going to shift up and now talk about, I'm going to ask each of them to tell us about one really cool project they're working on right now. And I've got one for Dave that I want him to talk about because it was so impressive to me. And that is, he's got miles and miles of track. And you know what was on the track? Trash. Tell us about what you did. So yeah, we, um, I, was, I was a little stunned, I guess, when I took the first train ride. I was, uh, I was accustomed to a different level of railroad uh, in Austin. But we hit the ground running. We've, um, we've really tried to be a good neighbor. And by being a good neighbor, that means we need to take, you know, like, we need to take care of our backyard. So we've, uh, along with our contractors, like I didn't go out and pick it. Well, I have picked up some. I, I will say, yeah. Uh, but we've removed about five to 600 tons did you hear that? Uh, debris. 500 uh, tons of trash from yeah, the train tracks. From our right of way. And, uh, and cause really, I mean, there's there selfish interests as well. So we want, we have, you know, we have transitory development. We want people to invest near our tracks and no one wants to invest next to that. So we've, uh, we've gone through a tremendous effort and we're working with the counties on, on helping with, uh, with some of the encampments that are near the tracks to find better places and safer places for, for people to be. And that's a benefit for all of us. Um, so we are continuing to, you know, to try to clean and harden our railroad and be a good neighbor. And then we're going to, we're going to take that and we're going to turn left and we're going to drive into this beautiful station, uh, right in the bright line station in Miami. And, uh, and we are exceptionally excited. We are rounding third, I think, uh, on that project. That's great, man. All right, Dottie, tell us about your big project. So I think the thing that is most exciting that we have going on right now is um, the construction of a new station. It'll be the first station on our rail line since we opened the rail line in 2010. And we are in partnership with the owners of Q2 Stadium, where the Austin FC soccer team plays, um, building a station literally on their back door. Um, They have a beautiful kind of outdoor amphitheater kind of uh, terrace that comes down toward the rail line and previously a fence and now it will be a station so we're really excited about that we are closing in we're rounding third on that one too we're closing in on getting that construction done um, we will open that in February um, and are very excited to have that station in place for the upcoming soccer season and I love it not only get going to be a beautiful station at a beautiful stadium Um, But it really helps us kind of uh, evangelize the value of transit because a lot of people who otherwise would not use our service, use our service to that game. We have standing room trains already, and the current station is a 15-minute walk from the stadium. Um, So I'm a teensy bit worried operationally what's going to (laughs) happen when um, we get the station open and and we're right there. But I'm confident in our rail ups teams. They are fantastic and will be able to handle it. But just being able to get people onto transit who aren't necessarily our normal demographic and have them talking about how great it was to be able to use the train to get to this event and have such a positive experience. When you're riding transit to an event, you're often having a good time, right? The intent, even if your team loses, the intent was to go out and have a good time. And so to be able to associate that with our public transit investments, I think is really important. So I'm looking forward to continuing to use that as an opportunity um, to teach new people how to use the system. And then just give us a brief highlight of the whole program. 
Yeah, so the rest of the Project Connect program includes two BRT lines. Um, We already have two in service that have been in service for about a decade, but we have our next two coming, and and these two will actually serve the eastern side of our service area, um, which is an area that has traditionally been um, underserved. Um, And so we are very excited to be starting up those lines. They will start up in about a year, about a year. I'm looking at my uh, capital guy over there and he's smiling like, yeah, sure, Dottie, about a year. Um, We're we're in we're we're not quite round in second on that one. Um, We're we're getting there. But we also um, are launching our fourth pickup zone. So pickup is our micro transit service. It's a zone based service where you can hail or ride anywhere within that zone to anywhere within that zone for the dollar 25, which is our base bus fare. Um, and so we're launching um, in kind of the Southeast Austin, the, one of those underserved, traditionally underserved areas where we'll be investing in BRT. We're launching a neighborhood connector and really helping those pockets of neighborhood connect to the transit system. There are some places that I'm sorry, no matter how hard I try, I'm never probably going to be able to run a, run a bus route frequently enough through here that it would really drive people to get out of their cars and get to transit. But if I can say, well, just go to this app and within 15 minutes, we'll pick you up and take you to the bus stop, then that actually makes a big difference. And so we're very excited about that to be launching that this coming January. Awesome. Tiffany? Well, I, uh, somebody at Lynx said that uh, Lynx is, we are elegant adopters. Uh, we'll let you all be guinea pigs and innovators. Um, but we are moving forward to contactless fare payment. I, it sounds, you know, like the duh factor, but we're moving in that direction. We are finally implementing an ERP system for our administration team. And these are the things that have needed to be done for a very long time. And we are, again, these are the projects that are finally moving forward to make us more efficient. Um, it, and so we, we we took some time during COVID. We installed the uh, uh, bus shields uh, for the yes, drivers, yes. for their safety. Uh, they had been asking for that for many years, uh, changed out our fare boxes. So now we're focused on our facilities um, as, and what else can we do to enhance the passenger experience? And going to David's point about the trash, it is a never ending battle with the trash. Um, and so we are looking at innovative ways to how do we zone out the contractors for that? How do it? And, and we want our passengers to take pride in our system. So and that that means doing our part, too. So. That's great. I'm excited on Wednesday, we're going to go film for Transit Unplugged TV all around the Link system to show some of their facilities for our episode for next month. I think it'll be our November episode. Yeah, and I was remiss in talking about our uh, public-private partnership with Beep. Right. We are doing a mixed traffic autonomous vehicle demonstration uh, with Beep, the Swan Shuttles. Um, Somehow, the city of Orlando, as well as the city of Altamont, have named their Beep Shuttles after birds. Uh, we have the crane shuttle and we have the swan shuttle. Um, but in reporting back to um, FTA on this demonstration, along with the NHTSA waiver, how do we how do we make the unions not afraid of autonomous, autonomous. vehicles? If you look at if if you have ATU, the first three um, of their pri- legislative priorities is to protect the jobs from autonomous vehicles. So we want to. We're always going to have attendance. We're always going to have an ADA issue. What we are doing is introducing new types of jobs into the link system with this demonstration. It's great. Thanks, Tiffany. All right, Frank, what are you, what's a fun project you're working on? Oh, yeah. So, you know, Paul, I came from the TOD side of the KCATA. Right. So, um, we've done about $300 million in projects before we got, I got in this role. And now we've really kind of doubled down on TOD. So, we just finished a project, about $85 million corridor project. Um, and what we're now doing is really trying to own corridors. So we are now, like say, Prospect is a 10 mile corridor that we have. Um, we have through what we call our four pillars of access to education, employment, healthcare, and housing through transit. And so the question becomes, when you get off our bus, where do you go? Where do you eat? Where do you live? Where do you play? Where do you go to church? What are all these things that you do? And so we work very close with the city of Kansas City through the land bank properties, the brownfield properties, to acquire the land and the corridors to basically control those 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 properties, own those properties, stage those properties to really say, okay, literally become a community development asset um, to our region. One, it builds density, which builds ridership, but also density of safety, uh, brings culture, diversity. It really builds a city back to life. Um, we'd be like 
feel like Kansas City is a city that was built for transit over 100 plus years ago. Um, we've got a city audit that we did that really identifies about 4,000 different zip codes that are within a mile or half mile from our, trans- our bus lines currently, which we know if we're intentional about the type of stuff we build, single family apartments, duplexes, over the next 10 years, we can probably build another 100,000 residents to Kansas City, Missouri, and another 30 to $40 million in property tax revenue all through transit. Um, I like to say that the ATA is an economic development agency that oper- operates transit. Um, we make we matter. We make it happen. And really trying to reframe how we view public transit as an economic driver um, and, and a community that brings value to a community, a value add, what we're considered necessary. And so we are really doubling down on TOD or we call it transit communities. Um, that's kind of my jam. And I think it's really, again, if we show we bring value as, a, as, an, as an authority, then people kind of want you at the table at the same time. With these projects, we create operational revenue that is not dependent on a sales tax, a ballot initiative, and allows us to really control our own destiny as an authority yeah. moving forward. That's, as you know, that's what they do in Hong Kong with MTR and other places around the world where the transit company uh, is able to increase property values so much that the taxes kind of cover the cost of the operation. Uh, or they have rents on the properties they own where they rent them out directly. And it's a great way to reduce our dependence on tax revenue. So that's brilliant, Frank. Thanks, ma'am. All right. Tell us what you got, Corey. Thank you. So um, from my perspective, I just want to switch the narrative just a little bit and talk about it from an initiative perspective. Um, And one of the things that's really uh, deeply important to me, and I've shared this with my team when I started, was the intent to create a just culture. Um, I've always wanted to do that. I really believe in it. I think that's the best way to manage people. Um, is to have a just culture in place. So so that's one of the initiatives that we're moving forward. And just to give you an example of of, of one of the things that we've been working on in that space is building a stronger relationship with our union. Um, And and quite frankly, we have been quite successful in doing that. Um, We just uh, completed our latest round of contract negotiations um, my understanding is that they sometimes would take years uh, to bring to closure, um, but we were able to do it. Um, I would say, uh, Angelica, who's is with me, about four months. So something that typically would take years to do, we were able to do in four months. Why did, why did that happen? It happened because we put a lot of value on our workforce. And, and when I say that, I mean in terms of putting that value on there, we realized that for us to be competitive, and to attract talent, we need to have wages and conditions that do, do that and recognize the dynamics and the changing and the diversity in our workforce. Um, we have a lot more um, uh, women uh, bus operators joining us now. Um, and so that creates an interesting dynamic, um, not only for women, but for all of our employees in terms of responsibilities outside of work, which shows up. Um, from the perspective of having schedules that allow them to take care of those responsibilities. Although, you know, we are 24-7, we all know that, but there are schedules that can be put in place to, to help manage that. Um, and so now we're, we've got wages that match um, what we need them to be to make us more competitive. Outcome, just the first outcome, is we had a job fair a couple of months ago. So we've been working really hard in our ret- talent acquisition space and we were able to hire on the spot about 64 bus operators and um, COAs. And we actually had, of those 64, 57 of them show up to work last Monday. So, I mean, and that is all a res- um, response to the initiatives that we've taken to build those better relationships with our you know, frontline workforce and have um, wages that match the demand that we need in South Florida. It's good. Yeah, it is interesting about our industry, isn't it? Because every transit agency doesn't compete against the other city. So they're not competitors. They're actually trying to share best practices. And that's actually the next question I have. So we're in the rounding the third base here, right? Two more questions. First off, I just want, if you could, don't mind, a show of hands, how many uh, of you are moving into electric buses? Just about, well, not you, yeah. <laughs> How about electric trains? <laughs> not yet, okay. And anybody doing hydrogen? Anybody up here doing hydrogen? You are moving? Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so we have been battery electric bus to date. Um, and my biggest piece of advice on battery electric buses is it's not about the bus. It's about the infrastructure. 
So don't think about what it's going to take to buy the bus. First, think about what it's going to take to basically fuel that bus, right? We already have tens of million dollars worth of most of us diesel or CNG fueling infrastructure built into our facility. So that infrastructure piece has been huge. Um, as we have looked through that, um, we are concerned about the ability of, ba- of range on a battery electric bus to be able to serve 100% of our transit needs. And so we are starting to look at hydrogen fuel cell enhanced battery electric buses um, and we'll and hope to be testing a handful of those out in the next little while. I, I think we have to be willing to change the way we do business, but to the extent that changing the way we do business makes it extremely more expensive, like there's a real balance there. And so how much more infrastructure do I want to put out in the world? It's one thing to put a million dollar opportunity charger at the park and ride, but what if that one goes down? So do I now need to put two $1 million chargers at the park and ride and now i have to maintain them and i've never maintained high voltage like i it's just a whole world um that as transit operators we hadn't really had to work in before um so it's it's still a lot i think we're all still learning from one another um so if anybody has horror stories about running hydrogen buses i want to hear them before i get the first (laughs) one i'd love to hear from you Medaxo is the world's largest transit technology company, so I've got to ask you a technology question. Tell me about one piece of technology that you see that's going to most impact your agency in the next one to three years. We'll start with you in Orlando. I think the contactless fare payment. Okay, yeah. uh, That, along with the integration of uh, SunRail is our commuter rail system here in Central Florida. The funding partners will be taking it over next year. Um, it's currently run by the state, the Florida Department of Transportation. So as we take on what is a commuter rail system, but how do we enhance that with great technology to make that seamless transition as we bring two systems together over the next year or so? Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, people love that. They want ease, right? Ease of uh, fare collection. That's good. If I can't explain it to you in 30 seconds, we're not doing something right um, because that's how our society is. We want it easy. We want it quick. Um, And so that's our marketing team, our IT teams, finance sit together and how can we make it? It's a 30 second elevator speech. That's really good. Frank, how about you? What what piece of technology is coming for you? Transit master. Boom. I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, no, seriously. I mean, we've got, we've got a World Cup coming in 2026. Um, and so how we communicate with our vehicles is going to be crucial for us. So you didn't pay me for this, but I, that is the truth. Thank you. How about you? So for me, the, the two technologies I think that are going to affect us the most, or at least I hope they do, is in the training space. So I really want to see us leverage virtual reality more for training, particularly mechanics. I think that is a a strong opportunity to use virtual reality to create environments where our mechanics can be stressed and understand um, some of the challenges uh, in the learning environment on, um, on, on fixing equipment. And also, you know, from an operator perspective, doing the same thing, right? So that they feel those uh, challenges in a traffic environment before we put them in one, right? Yep. So I would love to see um, our simulation capability move from the traditional simulators to a virtual virtual reality world. The other one that I'm particularly excited about is AI. And I know there was some conversation this morning about that, um, but I'm very curious to understand how AI can improve our relationships with customers and how we respond to customers and how we respond in real time to customers. So those are the two things that I think from a technology perspective, I can't wait to do. Yeah. And there are those that I don't even know about yet, but I'm, I'm game for sure. That's exciting. We just did a, uh, I just did an interview last week with Eve McCall from Microsoft Corporation and, um, a person from the Eno Center for Transportation who wrote an article this last week on AI. And it's going to be on our podcast, Transit Unplugged, coming up. But it's about just what you said. We've even got the video on it of uh, them turning a piece of equipment to go into a bus, but it's not really there. They're wearing glasses. It's virtual reality. And they're, they're showing them how to put it into the, uh, the engine of the bus. Really cool stuff. I'm glad you're, you're doing that. That's awesome. All right. All right. Dave? Uh, Corey hit it right on the head. I mean, AI is, we are so excited to see where we can leverage it. Like, I don't even understand it fully enough, and I know that it's going to help me, right? So, 
Um, you know, but it can help me as far as, uh, you know, scheduling and where, you know, where can we build our capacity? Where can we put our people? I mean, just the, the yeah. limits are endless. Um, and then we, so we've, we're, you know, we're trying to embrace that as we can. Uh, but we're also, you know, I don't want to say to step backwards, but we're trying to bring us to the present. So we have, you know, this beautiful neighbor of ours that's bright yellow and, and black, and they just ran to Orlando, and they're, they're, it's a beautiful service. I wrote it up here. And they have amenities that I want. Bright line. I won't always be, you know, I won't have, you know, the fundings are different. My ticket prices are different. But, like, why can't my people have some of those amenities? Like, why can't I have better public information system? Why can't I have better Wi-Fi? Why can't I have better connectivity? You know, it shouldn't be, you know, it's, uh, it's public transportation. It's good enough. It's not good enough. Yeah. It needs to be better. And that's the only way we're going to get the choice riders to come in and who want to go to the airports and want to go different places. Uh, and we need that. So we're trying to bring our level of customer service and, and customer amenities as, as much as we can. And we have to do it, obviously, within some budget constraints. But uh, I, really, I really think our people deserve better than what they're getting right now. Glad you're focused on that. It's great. Dottie? Yeah, I think um, the the real opportunity we have in the next three to five years, I still don't know how we're going to solve it, is to really lean into the idea of mobility as a service and have a seamless way for our customers to plan their trips, pay their fares, do the whole thing. Um, you know, I was belly aching to one of the vendors earlier today about how I have four apps um, to use my various services. They, they all kind of come with their own app, which is great. If you're only going to use that service, but if you want to use our bike share service, we can plan a trip that shows you how to use a bike to the bus. But actually, if you're going to pay the fare, it's a little different. And we have the pickup microtransit service that isn't exactly integrated as well. So really figuring out how to crack that nut. Um, and get it all on the same page. We've made all of these great advancements in our ability to deliver service, but if people don't understand it, if you can't explain it to them, or if they have to physically call your customer service call center to figure it out, then you've missed the boat, right? God love the customer service call center folks who solve all those problems for our customers every day, but that just shows that we hadn't figured something out that they were, were not able to figure it out on their own. It's great, great technology. All right, we're ready for the last question, and uh, it's a fun one. And you can say, you know, this will this will give you a broad palette to paint on. What's one of the best things happening right now at your agency? And if you want to tell a story about it, that's great too. So we'll start with Frank. Uh, we got the World Cup of 2026, and so um, just preparing for that from a federal, state, global piece is just an exciting project. Uh, gives us a chance to really put the ATA on on the, on the world stage and show off how great we really are. It's great. So there's a couple things I'm we're, I'm really excited about is um you know the first one is Miami Central Station. I mean you it's such a beautiful station. It's going to be it is. uh really a game changing event for us when we uh, when we take the first revenue train in, into the station. And uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, the people of South Florida have been infinitely patient, and and I think that lends into the the next thing I'm excited about is that you know we're we got kicked around the press a little bit in the last couple of years. You know, it's, you know, there's no hiding it, I guess. But uh, so we're, you know, we're starting to get momentum and we're starting to get some small victories and some small wins. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're crawl, walk, run. You heard it. We've heard that before. Right. Um, but we, uh, we're starting to get some momentum. So people are starting to, you know, they're starting to see that it's working and we're starting that, that, then that positive attitude comes through in the workforce. You know, we've got, we're going to be in the Miami Central. We've, we were awarded a grant for rolling stock. We're going to go out and buy some, some, a significant amount of, at least for us, rolling stock. Uh, so that is, I mean, the, just having that nice new cadence of momentum where people start to have, there's good news stories that are coming out in the press. And when people, you know, they come to work, they're proud to come to work, they're happy to come to work. We're doing good things. Um, and, and I just want to keep building on that. So that is just what I'm absolutely proud of right now. And we just got to keep building on it. Awesome. Dottie? I think one of the things I'm most excited about is the the energy we are putting into supporting our workforce and developing the workforce of the future. Uh, much like Corey, we had to have a real moment of clarity coming out of the pandemic as to what is the value of the work that our frontline employees do and, and how are we going to set a wage that will attract talent in the current market. Um, and so having made that pivot, that's step one. 
But it's also a really hard job to work the shift work that is required of many of our frontline employees to deal with the general public who, by the way, have completely lost their sense of decorum and common sense since the pandemic and are just awful nasty people on a regular basis to these folks. And so how can we support them better? Because fundamentally, our customers aren't going to get a great experience if the workforce that is serving them isn't satisfied with their work and doesn't feel they have the support that they need. And so we're really leaning in on training and retention, but then also developing the workforce of the future. We have this significant capital program that right now is all about construction, but when it's all constructed is going to require a lot of people who don't currently exist. Right. You know, I there the light rail signal maintainer that I probably need in a decade is currently in the eighth grade. And I can guarantee that he or she does not know that light rail signal maintainer is something that they might want to be when they grow up. They just know they like to tinker with this stuff. Right. They like to take stuff apart, and put it back together and see how it works. I need to find that kid. They need to find me. And so we're actually um, partnering with our local workforce board um, to do a study of all of the mobility and mobility infrastructure jobs that are needed in the next decade in our region so that we can get that pipeline going um, so that I can go find that eighth grader and make sure that they know what path to be on to have all the skills that are necessary so that when they're ready for work, I've got a career for them. So really investing in the workforce. That's a great vision. Really good. Tiffany? Yes, career and technical education is so important. I, we have all these medical pipelines and construction pipelines here in the state of Florida, but we don't have auto shop in high schools anymore, and we it, we need to create that pipeline. Mayor Demings announced it uh, this morning. Um, he has a $100 million initiative accelerated safety transportation program. Uh, Lynx will be a recipient of $6 million a year in additional operating funds from the from Orange County for increased service, as well as 264 new shelters over a five-year period. Um, Mayor Demings is one of our staunchest advocates for uh, uh, a sales tax in Central Florida, so we'll see where he goes with it in 24 or 26. Um, but uh, two of our biggest congressional um Champions are going to be starting their panel. Uh, they started a minute ago, Congressman Frost and Congressman Soto. Uh, there's never been a, a better time to uh, have a champion in Congress like we do with those two for Central Florida. So that's what we're excited about. That's awesome. And thank you for being such a great host for us here in Orlando. Really appreciate it. All right, Corey, bring us home. Okay, thank you. There's so many things that I'm incredibly excited about that's coming forward for us at um, BCT. Um, you know, namely the fact that we have the Primo plan coming forward. Um, that's huge. But I'm excited about the possible, right? Like what we can grow to, what we can be, what we will be. That excites me incredibly. And I'm also excited about the fact that I've got a great team to work with, and I'm excited for the future that we're going to build together. And in the audience, I've got Gia, I've got Chai, I've got Ripton and uh, Michael and Omar and um, Nikki and Lynn and Angelica and Kalila uh, over there somewhere in the back. I saw you there. She is waving. I'm excited, truly excited about continuing to work with you guys. And I know we're going to bring it home together. Way to go. Let's get a big round of applause for all five of our CEOs. Corey Cuff Lonergan, Dottie Watkins, Frank White, Tiffany Hawkins, and Dave Deck. Thank you so much for being here as part of our Transit Unplugged podcast live today for you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alaya Carey. I'm a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. Corey Cuff Lonergan talks in this segment about giving a shout out to your team. We all know that team appreciation is vital to keeping the lifeblood of our systems moving in the right direction. There are lots of ways to show people they're doing a great job. Driver or Staffer of the Month awards, employee appreciation events, holiday parties, and halls of fame are all good and necessary ideas. But you know what makes people feel really great? Actually being heard, especially by the senior members of your team. Letting your team know they're heard can take several forms. Just a good old anonymous comments box is a helpful start. You can also make time for feedback during your regular meetings. Set aside time on the agenda and make appropriate apologies and follow up if you don't get to everyone who wants to say something. There will often be someone who has more to say than you'd like, 
so delegating a spot on the agenda and a discrete amount of time for comments is key. I also encourage leadership to set up annual meetings with as many employees as possible. If you've got a huge team and it's not possible for everyone to meet with, say, your GM or chief of staff, direct the top tier of senior staff to the executive suite and provide time for lower tiers to have annual off-the-record time to check in with senior managers. If you'd like to talk more about supporting your team or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Hi, this is Tris Hussey, editor of Transit Unplugged. Thank you for listening to this week's episode and a special thank you to our guests, Corey cuff Lonergan, Dottie Watkins, Tiffany Homer-Hawkins, Dave Deck, and Frank White. Now, coming up on next week's show, Paul is talking with Adam Hill, editor-in-chief of ITS International Magazine, about high-speed rail in both the UK and North America and ULES zones, ultra-low emissions zones that are being set up around the UK to reduce pollution from cars. It's a really interesting discussion. I think you'll really like it. But before next week's show, Transit Unplugged TV comes out and it features Orlando, home of Tiffany Homler Hawkins and Brightline Trains. Watch Paul as he tours through Apta Expo, gets a tour of Brightline and Lynx and Beep Autonomous Vehicles. It's gonna be a really good episode. Watch for it Thursday, November the 9th. If you have a question, comment, or would like to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. Transit Unplugged is brought to you by Medaxo. At Medaxo, we're passionate about moving the world's people. And at Transit Unplugged, we're passionate about telling those stories. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.